Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our select little group. Um, I did once in the UK do an event in the Houses of Parliament, uh, and they have a whole rule there that meetings always start on time, whether or not anybody is there. And frequently, they genuinely start meetings with external people, and, uh, and there's nobody there at all. Uh, so we'll just start on time anyway. Uh, my name is John Renfrew. I'm a developer in the UK. And what we're just going to have a little kind of chat about this afternoon is about a, a journey from developer to advocate. But first of all, uh, a small amount about me. I'm a proper, actual, trained mathematics teacher, but I'm also a qualified lab and dance instructor. But that is from a very long time ago in my life. Um, but there's my Myers-Briggs profile, which, as you'll see, starts with I, which means doing this is a very weird experience. And next to it is my StrengthsFinder profile. We will actually talk a little bit about StrengthsFinder in today. And frequently what I, I say about myself when people say, what do you do? It's really impossible to say what we do, isn't it? Um, I do absolutely love driving fast. I genuinely mean that. I also love blank pieces of paper and coloured pencils. And my favourite material architecturally in the world is glass. I have quite a collection of uh, glass pieces brought from around the world. I'm not convinced about some of the stuff here, by the way. It's not my favourite style. Um, you can frequently find me on Twitter, and I have a GitHub. And to prove the I love driving fast, that is what I've been driving around in Texas for for the week before DevCon for my holiday. It's a Corvette Z06 19 model year. It's the fastest car I have ever driven in my life, and I loved it. It's absolutely brilliant. So I genuinely love driving fast. It's not just a product statement. So what we're just going to talk about today is the difference in a community between belonging and berating. Okay, I love alliteration, so that's where this is coming from. I'm going to start with a, asking a question that we should ask ourselves, which is, who are we? And what are we doing here in the community? Uh, we'll talk about sharing as a lifestyle choice, and how to cope if you're not an extrovert. Some people kind of assume that you have to be the big outgoing personality, and it's very much a bit of a personal journey. I can only really talk with confidence about myself, but there are some thoughts uh, as I looked at my own journey as a developer for the last eight years. 2010 was the first time I came to DevCon as a complete newbie uh, in San Diego. And while I had been persuaded by some other UK developers to go to DevCon because it was a great idea, I wasn't part of their social group. So genuinely, apart from those people, I knew nobody at a DevCon. And I've met people today and yesterday who are in exactly the same position as I was all that time ago. Um, and obviously now, first year ever, I'm on the, what I'm calling the big boy stage, been asked to speak. I've done things at uh, the Unconf before. And when I wrote this, I was about number 26 in our leaderboard on the community forum. I think it may be actually a little bit higher than that at the moment. So I've clearly gone from a developer to somebody who I would now describe as an advocate for the community. And genuinely, I have no ax to grind in the things that I'm saying. They are personal. I'm not speaking as a FileMaker employee. Uh, I haven't been told what to say by FileMaker. Obviously, it's been vetted, so I'm not saying stuff that's kind of stupid. And so some of those things are just observations, but hopefully that you may find them helpful. Uh, my FileMaker experience has primarily been built for quite a long time. I genuinely, I met FileMaker in a tour bus in Germany on tour with Mary J. Blige, her first ever European tour. It was a sponsored event by MCI, trying to get American troops to buy phone cards, because that was before mobile phones. I was introduced to FileMaker, I started running my own business. And then for about 17 years, we supported what you call in America Jaguar, but it's actually Jaguar cars in the UK. From this very first, the renewal of Jaguar, the XK8, 
when apparently to be a designer it was obligatory to have a moustache, to the F type. Uh, that was a photo that we actually supervised, photoshopped, ended up in a calendar. So I supported the PR department in Jaguar for a long time. So I ran my own business as my own developer, what we now call in-house citizen developer. I didn't know anything about the community. I learned everything from books and taught myself. The internet was still a baby. Google was, I don't know what they were doing at the time. And then I discovered the community. But the, the end of the story there is about why I'm now a full-time developer. So, first of all, all communities need rules. We did all, well, in the UK, when you're about 15, you read Lord of the Flies by William Golding. If you don't know the book, it's about a group of British schoolboys who get stranded on an island, and the story chronicles their somewhat disastrous attempt at learning how to govern themselves. Um, online, particularly, the idea about rules, where we're not in the same room as people, we're not even in the same time zone as people, we're not in the same language as people. We can't read signs like body language and other context. Facial clues. We may have never met the other people that we might communicate with. One of the great things that just happened outside um, here at DevCon, you get people saying, oh, I've never ever met you before, but I've talked to you online. That's one of the advantages of an online community. And obviously there are other, sh other, we're going to primarily talk about the FileMaker community sites, but obviously there are some other community sites which are collections of FileMaker people like FM forums. Um, I think one of the big things is that humour travels less well than we think it does. Um, as you know, the people that we British love to call Americans, um, we are two nations divided by a common language. Americans apparently know how to spell aluminium, but find it very difficult to pronounce, and know how to say colour, but apparently don't know how to spell it. Now, for an English person, that's a joke, but Americans may not actually find that terribly funny. To us, it is funny. Um, but humour frequently doesn't travel well, and things that you might say that are to you a kind of figure of speech may in fact be very odd to somebody else. So in the community, we have to recognise that the first thing that we bring is ourselves. That is all we can bring. Who we are, what we have, what we've picked up along our particular journey. So you have to start with what you have. And I would say that knowing yourself well is the best place to start. So I said I'd talk a little bit about Strengths Finder. One of the things that really helped me um, for a long time as a person, because I was somewhat creative and anti-establishment and a free thinker, I had a lot of problems fitting in with people who were significantly more kind of establishment or uh, reserved. And uh, one day, I was in, a, in an airport, I picked up a book by Marcus Buckingham called First Break All the Rules. I genuinely picked it up because of the title. Um, and what it was, was an analysis. Marcus Buckingham used to work for the Gallup organisation. They had interviewed lots of organisations and companies about working out why some became successful and others didn't. And they compared, in, in each chapter, they compared two two firms in the same industry, one of which had become a real success and one of which had kind of faded away. So the difference between Boeing and McDonnell Douglas was one, for example. Um, and his premise ended up being, from all the analysis that we did, it is the people that break the rules while at the same time understanding which rules you shouldn't break that manage to succeed. So the 3M mentality which was, we'll give you two hours a week and you can just do anything, and that's how we know that post-its turned up and sellotape and various other things, because somebody was allowed to break their rules. Um, but at the, the end of that book, he makes a fascinating statement, which is, go to work to do the thing you're best at every day. Oh, and by the way, we have a second book that comes out 
following on from that, and that's the Strengths Finder book. Um, you do an online test, it's, like a, it's not quite a personality test, and what you get back is out of 37 characteristics, strengths, you get back the things that are your top five. Um, and uh, then there's like a chapter for each, a few pages for each strength, and you read it and you go, how do they know that about me? Really, really weird experience. And then if you read a page for something that isn't one of your strengths, about two sentences in, you can't understand it anymore, and it's really boring, and I just don't get it. Genuinely. But the really interesting thing is, that what, it, what it does is it changes the conversation. It says, here's five things. These things are your strengths. These are the things that when you put in a situation, by default, you're likely to behave like this. This is the kind of things that you do. And somebody else has a different set of strengths. They're not weaknesses because you don't have them. That person has them. So there's lots of things about how you work in a team, making sure that, that there's a balance across the range of strengths. But the really interesting thing is for me that it gave me a language to talk about the things that apparently I had been passionate about all my life, but never had a way of putting into words. But it changes the conversation to strength. Kind of sounds like a bit of, I don't know, maybe does it, it's not new agey in a kind of vague way, it's built on some very interesting scientific principles. And at the same time, I received a grant from the UK government to, um, they said, you're a small business, what do you most need? And I said, business mentoring. So they gave me some money and said, go and spend this with somebody. And I got a friend of mine who did business mentoring um, as a job to come and work with me. And it was just around the time I did that. And that was the point at which I started to change my view about how I spoke about myself. It gave me a confidence that previously I hadn't necessarily had. And if other people know Strengths Finder, so it's like a Myers-Briggs thing, if you say, I'm this, then if you know that set of things, you can go, oh, okay, I understand that about you then. It's a shorthand way of, um, of relating to and understanding people. And as an ex-teacher, I really believe you are what you read, not what you eat. So my, one of my questions to people all the time is, how, how high is your pile of books that you bought and have still yet to read? And how frequently does, does that pile get added to? Do you have a shelf which is books that you want to have close to you all the time? Um, the ones that you want to read again because they were kind of so interesting. And what kinds of books do you surround yourself with? What kinds of influences, shall we say, do you surround yourselves with? So maybe 15 years ago when I was building a business, I was reading the likes of Tom Peters, Seth Godin, David Allen, who's uh, Get Things Done, Simon Sinek, uh, Alan and Barbara Pease, who are um, body language experts, trying to learn things that I could utilize for myself and in my business. And the top book there, if, you, if you've never read it, I do suggest this is the one book from this, as a book review that you go out and buy, it's called The Jelly Effect. The subtext is, most people do presentations as if they have in their hand a bucket of jelly, they throw the jelly at the wall and hope some of it sticks. Okay, The Jelly Effect, go and look it up for yourself. But, but, but what's in there, so that was a snapshot at some point when I did a presentation of what happened to be on my desk at work at the time. Um, that indicates whether or not you are doing a, I need to make sure that I have as broad an outlook on the world and life as possible. So, that's a little bit about me. Rules of the road, why, why do we have rules of the road? Uh, I suspect over here, many of you drive Mostly, they're there to stop people getting killed. Um, the white lines are there to not cross so that something dangerous or bad doesn't happen. And one of the reasons that communities say, hey, here's some rules, is exactly the same. Clearly, we're not talking about actual proper killing. 
but it's just to stop damage happening. So my first point would be, we have some rules in the FileMaker community. For those that have not yet done so, uh, read them. And then maybe work out how we could stick to them. And of course, if you're British in the audience in general, you'll be wanting to indicate to others your desire that they should also follow the rules, because we're very good at doing that. Um, the link at the bottom there is the link to the community website, which says, hey, here's the things that we think we should stick to in our community. Because the FileMaker community quite obviously says, we're here to help people use FileMaker, the products and technologies, much more effectively. So these, I think, are the five rules of our community uh, in terms of contributions. Stay on topic, be polite, be constructive, test out answers, and don't advertise, okay? They're, they're not very onerous, there's only five, they're very small. Um, at the bottom of posts, if you've never clicked this button, um, under actions, there's a little drop down, and the bottom one says, report abuse. Now that might, I don't know whether or not that's the right actual word, but if you think somebody is doing something that doesn't really fit the rules, there is a mechanism for us to indicate that. There's other things like, you know, somebody's swearing like mad and I really find it a little bit offensive. What happens to that is that somebody in FileMaker does read that. Um, I do know that is true because at one point in the past, it might be true that I had a couple of posts removed because I might have said things in a very strident way. I was a lot younger and much more inexperienced than I might be now. But we do have a mechanism for kind of going, really, that's not massively helpful. Rather than writing in the post, hey, could you just back off? We have a method of reporting it. So go and investigate if you haven't ever seen that. But at the same time, I'd also be going kind of as an educationalist. There are absolutely times to break the rules. The nature of a discussion must mean, if people are taking part from different sides, that the, it's the off-topic things sometimes that actually really bring enlightenment. So just kind of saying very rigidly, well, that's not what we're talking about here, may not be quite so helpful. And obviously a balance of views is generally considered to be a good thing. Sometimes the opposite view to the thing that we all think may in fact be the most helpful thing to consider. Uh, when I was a young teacher, somebody who was a great friend and mentor of mine used to frequently say this, the pooling of ignorance is not knowledge. A lot of people sitting in a room saying things which make no sense doesn't make it wise or helpful. But it doesn't mean that just because people disagree with you, actually it's all wrong. There's a, there's a brilliant story in a book um, about a rabbi who was in school teaching some students. Uh, and uh, he was teaching away and at some point got really frustrated and stopped and said, will somebody disagree with me? How are we going to learn if nobody disagrees with me? The idea that in education, dissonance, the idea that by putting an opposite opinion sometimes can actually bring us to a point where we can rethink something is really helpful. That doesn't clearly mean being aggressive and being rude and all of those other things. But actually sometimes it is breaking the rules um, that works. Obviously community is primarily built around the concept of sharing, which I think is an attitude first. You come to something saying, I'm coming here because I'm going to share, um, which leads to actions. Uh, many other tech kind of communities, because we're not the only community in the world, are built around a platform to allow people to give stuff away to competitors. But in the process, what that does is by putting something kind of in the public domain, you allow somebody else to take it, modify it, break it, fix it, comment on it, improve or extend your work. 
Um, I, I did a technical session yesterday on card windows. I showed a piece that, uh, that I've put onto the community on the app innovations. It's a calendar picker. I sat in a session yesterday afternoon. The guy behind me said, oh, can I just show you this? He'd taken what I'd done, um, used it for a client piece of work, and improved what I'd done. That's absolutely brilliant, and that is the point about a sharing community. It's not to go, we've got to have my name on it all the time. It's about going, there you go, let's see what you can do with that. Uh, my very, very first DevCon. This is not, the bottom line here is not an unusual experience. One of the first sessions I went to was our kind of amped up Baptist pastor used car salesman enthusiast Todd Geist who was waxing lyrical, as he was in fact yesterday, about the benefits of sharing code with each other. The idea that we don't have to keep reinventing all of our own wheels all the time, but if we share things, we all get better as a result. What kind of things do you potentially have to share? For you, you have your experience. You might have your problems. You might have some solutions that you've worked out. You definitely will have an approach or an angle to the way that you look at something that is for somebody else a potential problem. And I think, crucially, we all have the ability to share samples. It's really quick and easy in FileMaker to make a file I guarantee I could ask you all in less than five minutes to do a really quick file that did one thing that you could say, here's this thing in action. Really simple to do is to share a sample. And here I think GitHub is a great paradigm for sharing. Obviously, since Microsoft bought Git GitHub, lots of people are kind of jumping ship and going to GitLab. But if you don't, if you don't know GitHub, it's a, it's, a, it's a site that we can have accounts on, and we can just put stuff on there as a repository. It's open and free uh, to all. But importantly, within GitHub is the idea that you can make a comment or raise an issue on the piece of code that is there. So if I say, here's a thing, it's on GitHub. Go and have a look at it. And then you go, you can put, you can put a thing in and go, John, it's broken. This doesn't work. I can see that. I can fix it. I can put a new version up, tell you a new version's there. Um, so we have in the FileMaker community, obviously, the app, app innovation space. If you've never been to that part of the website, that's the link to it, which obviously is in the materials. And I think one of the important things here is to take people at face value. So when somebody says, here's a thing, do you want to comment on it, or do you want to use it, or do you want to fix it? They genuinely mean it's okay to take it and make a comment on it and say, oh, I don't really like that, or could you fix that, or I've done this with it. Take people at face value if they are sharing things. Um, I have a feeling that it was in a conversation I had with Todd at some point at a conference where we said, genuinely these days, nobody needs to rent or hire a proofreader. All you have to do is put your copy on the internet and within five minutes, somebody will tell you what's wrong with it. Uh, I shouldn't be spelling it like that. And I think you find there should be a comma there. GitHub is, is a kind of positive, structured way. So I think that's, that's we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. But it's, it's a way of saying, well, just share things. Here's a place to do it. Tell people how to get there. Put a link. Off you go. And the other thing um, is to consider that you are your own expert. You all have things which you will be good at doing. You may have lots of things you're good at doing. Um, and sharing within the community allows you to demonstrate your strengths. It might be that you have, say, particularly an expertise in accounting. So when people ask questions that relate to accounting, you have something that you can share. In my particular case, initially, at, that, at the time I came into the community, I'd be doing a lot of experimental work around PDFs, 
um, from creating them from code, being able to generate them on a server well before FileMaker gave us the ability to do it natively. Uh, and I spoke at a couple of little conferences about that, and I got a little bit of a reputation that that's what I knew about. And obviously a community is a place where when we give answers, we can just share our expertise with people. Say, hey, I do know something about this. Maybe this is helpful. Maybe you are genuinely the only person doing what you're doing, apart from the other person who's asking a question. Whatever field you're in, whatever industry you're in. So expertise on things like law, medicine, um, manufacturing, change control, those kinds of things, if you have an expertise, actually it's going to help all of us if you may find a way to share that. And let's be honest, we are basically magpies. Anything that's free and shiny will be picking up, won't we? <laughs> if they put out tables outside with lots of shiny things that are free that say FileMaker on them, they'll all go because we'll be taking them. Well, the same is true on sharing sites. People put the stuff there so they can share them, and people download it and take it. And obviously, there are lots of opportunities to share in person. So, um, smaller conferences, everything from local and regional user groups are places where people can give presentations. Um, other organized events, which you might have already seen or heard about, like Pause on Error. Um, in Europe, we have .fmp. Uh, the CQDF is a French-speaking conference in Montreal, uh, which I've been to once, twice now. Um, there are other opportunities to start sharing a, with people in a much smaller environment, and B, if you have something to say and share, there are small conferences to start in. Because it's a little bit daunting to say, well, I think I can go and speak at DevCon. But frankly, after the first year I went, I did try, because <laughs> I thought I was good enough, but not for about, apparently, eight years. And in fact, the FileMaker people may be correct uh, on that. So I need to explain a little bit what this slide is about. It's a visual joke. If you understand this, you will get this. Uh, in the UK, this is called a Birmingham screwdriver. I live in Birmingham. It's the center of the, it's about 120 miles north of London. It's the center of the country, and it used to be at the center of the industrial heart of the country. Um, not the shipbuilding pieces, but to the north, we had the potteries. Um, Wedgwood and people like that, so there's lots of smoking chimneys. To the west, we have what we call the black country. Uh, Cleveland, I think, is the nearest to it. Uh, industrial chain making, lots of black chimneys. To the southeast, we have Coventry, the home of the bicycle, and then the car industries in the UK. Uh, and Birmingham itself, a massive jewellery quarter. But at one point in, in the world's history, 90% of the nibs for pens, when you dip them in ink, were made in Birmingham. And at one point in time, Birmingham had the highest concentration of people who had a patent in their name of anywhere in the UK. So it's a very industrial area. So we have lots of industrial people and lots of industrial tools. So let me explain. A Birmingham screwdriver is the idea that rather than use a screwdriver to screw a screw into the wall, you just use a hammer and hammer it in, okay? So it has become colloquially, colloquially um, a term for this. This is a quote from Maslow. I'll read it out for you. I remember seeing an elaborate and complicated automatic washing machine for automobiles that did a beautiful job of washing them, but it could only do that, and everything that got into its clutches was treated as if it were an automobile to be washed. I suppose it is tempting, if the only tool you have is a hammer, to treat everything as if it were a nail. 1996, that's where the quote comes from. Um, it may be that there are people in our community who act in this kind of way. There is, they have one solution, and they will apply that one solution to everything, regardless of whether it's the right or an appropriate solution. And it has the same effect 
as just walking around with a hammer and hitting everything. So therefore, I might suggest that the first thing we should do is make sure that we don't do the same ourselves and potentially we find ways to challenge it. The visible signs of that are that every problem can be solved by this one thing. There is an English word I'm going to start to introduce to the community from the 1500s. That's when most of your parent, 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 parents actually lived where we live now. Um, from the 1500s, it's a mumpsimus. Okay, it's a fantastic old English world word, and it means someone who sticks obstinately to their beliefs in spite of clear evidence that they are wrong. I may suggest there may be a few people like that on the community that you may have seen or heard. Um, a very positive thing that we can do in the work that we're doing, I feel, is to give credit where credit is due. It's really simple when we're writing something up to say, I saw this idea from this other person, here's a link to it. Here's a, here's a sample with a custom function in it, and in the custom function, here's where I got that from, or here's the original person who gave me the idea, and I've amended it. It's really simple in our code, in commenting, to give credit to people. And as somebody who, um, who has done things that other people have taken and used, I have to tell you, it's really lovely when at the bottom they say, oh, I got this idea from John Renfrew. Actually makes me feel really, really good when people do that. And we can do that for and with other people. So in the contributions that we make, referencing other people, saying, so-and-so said this, or I've seen this link to this, and this blog post from some other company. And obviously we can do that in our general, in our code, in readme uh, scripts or in an about layout listing people that may have helped us. Because I think as a community, and I personally really uh, feel this, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants, the people who've been before us and done things. So developers who were around 10 years ago, who might have had a big presence in the community, who influenced me a great deal. Um, I know that I stand on the shoulders of some of the work that they've done. And I hope that in, kind of, effectively, in 10 years' time, there's other people who could be just as inspired by me to do things and then come back and go. Um, I once met uh, a tour manager for a band, and it's a band that I would have loved to have worked with. And he said, oh, I only got into the industry because there was this festival that we used to go to every summer, and you were a stage manager there. And when I was a teenager, I saw you on the stage, and I knew who you were, and I decided that's what I wanted to do. And kind of 15 years later, I met him, and he said, that's what I did. And I got into it because you sort of somehow influenced me. One of the things that we, I think sometimes we don't realize is just how much other people are watching the things that we do and say and the way that we do them, and the way that we behave. Uh, they, are, they are an influence on people. So, in a forum, it's built around the idea of asking questions. And one of the things that we have to be aware of is that we deal with people that we call newbies, people who've just turned up for the first time. Um, and one of the things about when you're very new, particularly in the technical community, is you might not know how to ask the question in a way that's most helpful is, is an issue. And it, I don't think it's wrong if we've been in the community for a while to, to go back and say, well, have you given us enough information? Just kind of, you've written, a, you've written what you consider to be a problem that you need help with. But have you given us enough information to help you? So how many times do we actually look at the profile of the person who's asked the question because if they've got about three points, you know that they haven't been in the community very long, and maybe they're, they're kind of quite new. And sometimes they actually say, I'm kind of new here. And so take note of that. There are people who frequently seem to ignore that um, question. And often people who are new will start with, I'm really new here. I don't know if this is stupid. There is a bit of a clue that they are new here. <laughs> um, and we should <laughs> potentially uh, try and help them. Um, I, met, uh, I met two people here 
It, this is their first ever DevCon, and we're talking about, and they've only been doing FileMaker for six months. Uh, I talked about, and they said, oh, we've started reading things on the community, so I knew kind of who you were and everything. Some of it's a bit harsh, isn't it? And the answer is, yes, unfortunately, it is. If we, if we want to become more respected in the community, I think one of the ways to do it is to be more gentle in the way that we, we deal with people. Don't, we can't and shouldn't expect everybody else to know everything that we already do. Assuming that somebody else is au fait with our technical language. We have a lot of technical words in FileMaker that mean special things to us. And it takes a while to learn those because there isn't a dictionary that we can download that says, oh, by the way, could you just learn these before you ask a question? And what happens, and it's, it is unfortunately a bit of a male trait, that we, in this environment, become the keepers of the kingdom. We think we've got the secrets and nobody can else can have them. I don't think that's a helpful piece of behavior. But I think it's fair to ask people, have you got an example? Can you actually show us what you're talking about? And that can be everything from, or could you at least take a screenshot of what you're seeing? I frequently do that when people ask something, because I can't, I'm, otherwise I'm guessing what it is that's in their head that they're talking about. But I think there's a great, um, a great paradigm from Stack Overflow. Um, they've put up, a, there's a link to it, put up a thing that says, here's how to generate what they call a minimal, complete, and verifiable example. Minimal should use as little code as possible to be able to produce the problem, should be complete, should have everything that somebody else needs to be able to produce the problem as well, and it should be verifiable. It should actually produce the problem. So sometimes, when you say, could you make a little file that does that, people go away and do it, and then they, then they come back and go, oh, I fixed it while I was doing that. It's like that magic, I wasn't even in the room and I managed to fix it for you thing. Um, but that's, that's a beautiful moment when somebody actually figures out for themselves in the act of trying to work out what the problem was. So minimal and readable. Start from scratch. One of the people go, you go, could you send us something with your file? And they go, oh, I can't do that because it's full of data and it doesn't belong to me and it's all kind of protected. Well, make a new file that does actually show the problem. Start from scratch. Divide and conquer. If it's a massive great thing, try and narrow down where the problem might be. Don't, I don't need your whole system if the problem appears to be here. Uh, make sh and encourage people to make it a complete thing. That all the stuff that you need is there to reproduce the problem. Because the second you put a file up that says, here's my problem file, somebody will download it, open it, have a go at trying to fix it. There are occasions on the forum where you can see within five minutes of somebody saying, here's my file, somebody's gone, here's my file back, I fixed your problem. The second you post something, somebody will download it and have a go with it. And one of the big things, obviously, that we understand, and you know, this will, wouldn't just be a message for this kind of thing, it's in other sessions as well. The problems may not be where we, where we think they are. It's one of the very, if you, if you do Kaizen, Six Sigma, any of those kind of analysis things, instead of looking at symptoms, you want to be looking at root cause. Decide where the problem really is as opposed to where it exhibits itself. So what you think is the problem may not be the problem, it may be somewhere entirely. There was a, a recent, <clears throat> a great, excuse me, a great example on the forum recently of somebody who said, oh, I've got a real problem because uh, we, uh, the data seems to be replaced by a single star, and then we go and fix it, and then five minutes later, another record's changed. Uh, and the actual answer to the question was, have you considered that somebody isn't going into find mode when you think they are? And they're putting a star. And this person came back and said, I found it, it was in a script I wrote, and it was exactly that. So I don't know, if that person's in the room, that's kind of really embarrassing, isn't it? Was it you? Oh, really? That's amazing. <laughs> well, I'm glad we got it fixed. Um, the problem that is presented isn't necessarily where the problem really is. And, you know, you have, 
James Surowiecki, isn't it? The wisdom of crowds. What we're doing is crowdsourcing wisdom to solve problems. Um, uh, please resist this behavior in all people as far as possible. It doesn't work is not a problem statement. <laughs> in terms of encouraging people to help us to help them, tell us what the expected behavior should be. Tell us what's happening. Tell us what the error messages are. Take a screenshot. Give us the actual results that you're getting rather than just go, it doesn't work. And obviously, any example files that we encourage people to put up, it should be verifiable. To help solve the problem, we should be able to verify that the problem exists. So there's, a, there's obviously there's a, there's some technical threads report a problem issue on the website. And one of the most frequent answers in there is, we, could, you put, give, could you give us a file? Somebody gives them a file, and then it says, our testing department can't verify that this problem exists. So if somebody else can't verify that there is a problem, it's really difficult for them to understand then. So you can go all you like, doesn't work here, doesn't work here, but there may be some other issues that you need to consider. So eliminating issues that aren't relevant to, to the problem and ensuring that the example that you produce does actually reproduce the problem. Um, there is a, there's a forum that I've been part of for a long time where a developer of a particular library is somewhat aggressive in this attitude and I love him for it because there are people who turn up and basically say, without saying it in so many words, oh, I can't be bothered to do this. Could you just fix this for me and give it me back? Um, as an educator, I don't like that as an attitude. I want people to learn what we are all doing together. It's that whole thing about if you give a man Give a man a loaf of bread, he'll be hungry, he'll be fine for today. If you give him a fishing rod and teach him how to fish, he's fine for the next three weeks or whatever that example is. Um, helping people to understand and learn in the journey rather than just going, there you go, fixed it. Fixing it may solve the short-term problem, but people haven't necessarily learned. And genuinely, as a person who's done this, as a contributor, giving back a small sample file is to, to demonstrate a solution, is well loved by people. Um, Kevin Frank's website, uh, pharmacahacks.com, is amazing. All Kevin does is write blog posts and put, put sample files. And he's a brilliant contributor to the community as a result. His resource there is amazing. It, and it's free. Well, the whole point about most of this is it's free. And there are lots of other blogs from some of the bigger contributors and communities in the, uh, in the uh, companies in the community, Saliant, Beeswack, DB Services, Geist, who have blogs and frequently there's a, and there's a file to download. Personally, I'm not a massive fan of keeping on having to make up an email address just to get the file, but that's their issue. There are lots of places to get resources to help ourselves and obviously inside our own community. Uh, when I was a student and after that there was a comedy program on uh, British television with a comedian who was playing a man much younger than himself but he was um, like most of the millennials now still living at home with his somewhat overbearing mother and one of the catchphrases uh, was mind your manners Timothy because she was just kind of terribly proper about everything. So I was just going to throw out a challenge as to what your manners were. I guarantee, well, no, whatever, whatever your family's way of raising you, and that's everything from houses where you have to take your shoes off of the front door, or where you have to make sure you use the correct knife and fork, or where dinner is always at six o'clock on, on the table at night and you have to be there, and, or don't speak when there are guests and, unless they ask you. There are, you know, we generate, we have our own rules, and they're, but they're around manners. I guarantee that each one of you was raised to say thank you. Writing interminable letters to aunts that you've never met at Christmas is the bane of all seven-year-old boys' lives. But it's the right thing to do is to say thank you because it's appreciated. 
So something else that people frequently do in a forum is you provide them an answer and then they never bother to come back and say thank you. So the first thing we can do is to say thank you ourselves and for it to be a community where we lead by example there. Um, the only thing that is a genuine personal plea that I think we should challenge people on, I, I really do think it's time, particularly for people who've, who've been part of the community for a long time, I think it's time to stop be hiding behind obscure usernames and funny little avatars. I'm not a 12-year-old skateboarder. And I don't belong in the community of skateboarders. That's why my name and a picture is on the forum. There are some people who are hiding behind that. Challenge them. Say, it's about time you gave us your name. Wouldn't that be lovely? Because then I know who you are. Uh, one of the things that people frequently say in the forums is, oh, well, what's the point in doing this? Nobody at Farmaker ever reads. Sorry, I'm speaking in a kind of grumpy 13-year-old British teenager's voice there. Nobody ever reads what I write. How do I personally know that the staff engage with what we write? Because every now and then I get an email in my inbox from somebody at Farmaker saying, I read that, thank you, that was really helpful. We know that the staff read things. Um, as Rosemary pointed out um, in the keynote, we now have some MVPs. Uh, Wim, Beatrice, Beverly, Mike B, Josh, Jeremy. And I didn't know Mike was, so I've just added him to the end of the list. But these are our MVPs, most valuable people or players in the community. They're not there as a policeman, but they are there as us to just help things run smoothly. That's why they contribute quite a lot. Um, and we also have actual proper Farmaker tech support people on the forums. So I did only learn today that people whose names, usernames on the forums start with TS, it stands for tech support. <laughs> but the, but the, it's obvious, well, why didn't I realize that? Um, but we have TS Gal, TS Pigeon, TS millions of other things. Um, they have different responsibilities, but uh, they are in fact Farmaker people from the tech support team. They're not engineers, so berating them isn't terribly helpful. So making sure that when other people do that, we kind of go, that's not really the job, do you want to back off? Um, but they are part of, all part of the thing about just making the mechanics of having a forum with tens of thousands of people in uh, work well. And I do value the contributions that many of them make. And obviously, one of the big things about being a community is talking to people. So, as somebody who has I at the beginning of their Myers Briggs profile, this is much more difficult than you might imagine. I'm fine in a group of about two. Um, in any room where there's more than several hundreds of people, I want to be the one standing at the back. And it's not kind of really a joke, but I genuinely want to know where the introvert table is every time I come to a big conference like this, so I can sit on my own and nobody's worrying about me thinking I'm depressed or wanting to come and talk to me in a very American kind of way, tell me your life story. I'm fine being left alone. But one of the major reasons I really have discovered for coming to DevCon is it is a chance to meet people and people who make things happen while we're doing learning. Um, you get to chat with people and put the face to the name so the next time you see a contribution to that person, there's a person behind it. Um, Don Levan, who used to be quite active in our community, um, I went to Pause and Error in New York about, six, uh, about seven years ago, genuinely didn't know anybody, went downstairs for breakfast. The first person I met was Don. And he said, oh, John Renfrew, we've had a conversation online, and it was about something technical. And I went, you're Don. And we just started chatting. So it was a whole kind of, suddenly there was a face to the connection, and then we, it, it meant that the conversations that we had online had more meaning. Um, Equally, we had a conference in the UK, um, a pause on error style conference, and I decided I'd do a presentation on virtual lists, and sitting in the front row was Bruce Robertson, who was the person who brought the technique to the community. That's not at all frightening or scary, but 
he had come not to supervise what he thought I was going to say, but he had come to learn. Well, I think one of the points is that actually the reason we come to DEF CON and all these events is not just to go, I know it all, but to sit here and go, I've come to learn. I get very disappointed if I go to an event, I don't think I've learned something. So the, the being a developer, like just my own in-house developer, to becoming an advocate, it's a very, for me, a very personal journey. It's built around the fact that, oh, seven or eight years ago, what I may describe as some rather naughty bankers did somewhat ruin the economy. They weren't all American. They were across Europe as well. Um, and I was working at the time in the car industry. So let me tell you, every time there's a recession, the first thing that people do is postpone the decision to buy a new car. They don't stop buying cars, but they just go, nope, we're not having a new one right now. And it's frequently, it's been for many years on a kind of 10-year cycle of boom and bust in the industry. Um, I was running a company that helped a car company launch new cars. That was all of my business. I was using Farmaker heavily to run my business. Literally overnight, all of my business disappeared. And the other people that I might have worked for, audiovisual companies in my area, also had no work. It wasn't just the car industry. In fact, I, at the time, I think you could get a conference done next Monday for 5,000 people and all you'd have to pay for is the staff. You could get the equipment for free, genuinely. And when the market price is zero, there's no competition, there's no point of entry. Um, and unfortunately for me, at the point of kind of uh, work coming back, because the company had been sold by Ford and bought by Tata, they decided, well, we'd like to use some really big, expensive London agencies now. We don't want to use local people. So at a point of expecting work to come back, none of it did. I genuinely lost millions of dollars in the process. But I had a skill, and I went, I need to do something else. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not sitting around. I'm not retiring early. And that was the start of my, let me go and see if I can properly actually be a developer. And here I'm standing on a stage, and it looks like I might have just made it work. It is a personal journey. But the interesting thing is I've said to a few people, I'm, I met somebody yesterday who I first met at DevCon about five years ago. She's from Mississippi. And I said, but you've been here for five years. You now have five years more things that you could teach to people who have only just been here for the first time. At whatever stage we're at, it's not about saying, hey, I've arrived. But it's about saying at whatever stage we're at, what being community is about is about sharing what we have. So what we have is me, who I am, what I know, and then approaching the community as somebody who's here to learn and listen first. It's no accident that we have two ears, two eyes, and one mouth. Sharing in a collaborative kind of way. And I believe it's the art of asking better questions that helps us all. Sometimes the one incisive question that somebody else can ask is the key that unlocks a door or whatever other metaphor we wish to use. And we can be that for other people who are struggling. Something that we may know we can share and it will help somebody else. Um, I, it wasn't, my mother was a great influence on my, my father ran a shop. He worked every Saturday I was growing up. So we didn't do that regular like weekend stuff. He never came to watch me playing sport. My mother was a great influence on me. And I would say now that I am very much like her. The heart of an artist, she was very creative, like a quilter and a knitter and all that kind of stuff. But she was a research chemist. That's, but that, it's just me. If I brought any of you up here and said, just tell me a bit about you, you'd have a different kind of story. But that's what you bring to the community, the story that is you. And my encouragement to people in the room and to people who are going to listen and to people in the wider community is that if we make sure that we are bringing the best version of ourselves to the community, that will be the most help for us. 
you've been marvellous. You've been very well behaved. You haven't been running around. Um, thank you for listening so much. Um, there's no updates, but that set of slides is there, so some of the links that I may have uh, mentioned are there. If you have a question to ask, because the session's being recorded, if you want to go and use a microphone, we'll have a chat about that. If not, we can all go and be British and have a cup of tea. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and it's day two, but we still have to say this. If you could go there and fill out your evaluation, not just for this session, but for other, and clearly filling out evaluations for sessions you didn't go to, not quite what the intent is, but if you could please go and fill out an evaluation, that would be marvellous, as I say. Thank you. Any questions? Rosemary, hello. Hello, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. And just remind everybody else that if you're also looking to get more involved, you can come learn about the roadmap tomorrow. What time is that? 10.30. Okay. And I don't remember what room, but it's on the schedule. Or it's okay. not on the web schedule, but it's in DevCon to go now. Okay. Thank you. I, I, genuinely, I think one of the things that DevCon brings to us is that people like Rosemary are here in the corridors and will just stop and talk to you if you stop and talk to her. She will make time and other farm maker people will as well. I think that is the brilliant, genuine bonus. And therefore, again, if somebody stops you, take time to stop and talk to them and share the stuff that you have to share and encourage people. Uh, and that may make us a better community. No questions? Thank you very much. Indeed.